Chapter Zero of The Flying Girl. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Diana Schmidt. The Flying Girl by L. Frank Baum. Forward. The author wishes to acknowledge her indebtedness to Mr. Glenn H. Curtis and Mr. Wilbur Wright for courtesies extended during the preparation of this manuscript. These skillful and clever aviators, pioneers to whom the art of flying owes a colossal debt, do not laugh at any suggestion concerning the future of the aeroplane, for they recognize the fact that the discoveries and inventions of the next year may surpass all that have gone before. The world is agog with wonder at what has been accomplished. Even now it is anticipating the time when vehicles of the air will be more numerous than there are automobiles today. The American youth has been no more interested in the development of the science of aviation than the American girl. She is in evidence at every meet where aeroplanes congregate, and already recognizes her competence to operate successfully any aircraft that a man can manage. So the story of Orissa Kane's feats has little exaggeration except in actual accomplishment, and it is possible her ventures may be emulated even before this book is out of press. There are twenty women aviators in Europe. In America, there are thousands of girls ambitious to become aviators. An apology may be due those gentlemen who performed so many brilliant feats at the 1911 meet at Dominguez, for having thrust them somewhat into the shade to allow the story to exalt its heroine, but they will understand the exigencies that required this seeming discourtesy, and will, the author is sure, generously pardon her. End of Forward Chapter One of The Flying Girl. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason in Panama. The Flying Girl by L. Frank Baum. Chapter One Orissa. May I go now, Mr. Burthon? asked Orissa. He looked up from his desk, stared a moment, and nodded. It is doubtful if he saw the girl, for his eyes had an introspective expression. Orissa went to a cabinet wardrobe and took down her coat and hat. Turning around to put them on, she moved a chair, which squeaked on the polished floor. The sound made Mr. Burthon shudder and aroused him as her speech had not done. "'Why, Miss Kane!' he exclaimed, regarding her with surprise. "'It is only four o'clock.' "'I know, sir,' said Orissa uneasily. But the mail is ready, and all the deeds and transfers have been made out for you to sign. I... I wanted an extra hour tonight, so I worked during lunchtime. Oh, very well, he said stiffly. But I do not approve this irregularity, Miss Kane, and you may as well understand it. I engage your services by the week, and I expect you to keep regular hours. I won't go, then, she replied, turning to hang up her coat. Yes, you will. For this afternoon I excuse you, he said, turning again to his papers. Orissa did not wish to offend her employer. Indeed, she could not afford to. This was her first position, and because she was young and girlish in appearance, she had found it difficult to secure a place. Perhaps it was because she had applied to Mr. Burthon during one of his fits of abstraction that she obtained the position at all but she was competent to do her work and performed it so much better than any secretary the real estate agent had had before that he would have been as loath to lose her as she was to be dismissed but orissa did not know that and hesitated what to do run along miss kane said her employer impatiently i insist upon it for tonight so being very anxious to get home early the girl accepted the permission and left the office feeling, however, a little guilty for having abridged her time there. She had a long ride before her. Leaving the office at four o'clock meant reaching home forty minutes later, so she hurried across the street and boarded a car marked Beverly. Los Angeles is a big city, 
because it is spread from the Pacific Ocean to the mountains, an extreme distance of more than thirty miles. Yet it is of larger extent than that would indicate, as country villages for many miles in every direction are really suburbs of the metropolis of Southern California, and the inhabitants ride daily into the city for business or shopping. It was towards one of these outlying districts that Orissa Kane was now bound. They have rapid transit in the southwest, and the car, headed toward the north but ultimately destined to reach the sea by way of several villages, fairly flew along the tracks. It was August, and a glaring sun held possession of a cloudless sky, but the ocean breeze which always arrives punctually in the middle of the afternoon rendered the air balmy and invigorating. It was seldom that this young girl appeared anywhere in public without attracting the attention of any who chanced to glance into her sweet face. Its contour was almost perfect and the coloring exquisite. In addition, she had a slender form which she carried with exceeding grace and a modest, winning demeanor that was more demure and unconscious than shy. Such a charming personality should have been clothed in handsome raiment, but alas, Poor Orissa's gown was the simplest of cheap lawns, and of the ready-made variety that apartment stores sell in their basements. It was not unbecoming, nor was the coarse straw hat with its yard of cotton-back ribbon, yet the case was stated today very succinctly by a middle-aged gentleman who sat with his wife in the car seat just behind Orissa. "'If that girl was our daughter,' said he, "'I'd dress her nicely if it took half my income to do it. Great Caesar!' Hasn't she anyone to love her or care for her? She seems to me like a beautiful piece of bric-a-brac, something to set on a pedestal and deck with jewels and laces for all to admire. Pshaw, returned the lady, a girl like that will be admired whatever she wears. Orissa had plenty of love bestowed by those nearest and dearest to her, but circumstances had reduced the family fortunes to a minimum and the girl was herself to blame for a share of the poverty the Canes now endured. The car let her off at a wayside station between two villages. It was in a depression that might properly be termed a valley, though of small extent, and as the car rushed on and left her standing beside a group of tall palms, it at first appeared that there were no houses at all in the neighborhood. But that was not so. A well-defined path led into a thicket of evergreens, and then wound through a large orange orchard. Beyond this was a vine-covered bungalow of the type so universal in California, artistic to view but quite inexpensive in construction. High hedges of privet surrounded the place, but above this, in the space back of the house, rose the canvas-covered top of a huge shed, something so unusual and inappropriate in a place of this character that it would have caused a stranger to pause and gape with astonishment. Orissa, however, merely glanced at the tent-like structure as she hurried along the path. She turned in at the open door of the bungalow, tossed hat and jacket into a chair, and then went to where a sweet-faced woman sat in a Morris chair, knitting. In a moment you would guess she was Orissa's mother, for although the features were worn and thin there was a striking resemblance between them and those of the fresh young girl stooping to kiss her. Mrs. Kane's eyes were the same turquoise blue as her daughter's but although bright and wide open they lacked any expression, for they saw nothing at all in our big, beautiful world. "'Aren't you early, dear?' she asked. "'A whole hour,' said Orissa. "'But I promised Steve I'd try to get home at this time, for he wants me to help him. Can I do anything for you first, Mama? "'No,' was the reply. "'I am quite comfortable. Run along, if Steve wants you.' Then she added in a playful tone, "'Will there be any supper tonight?' Oh, yes, indeed. I'll break away in good season. Never fear. Last night I got into the crush of the rush hour, and the car was detained, so both Steve and I forgot all about supper. I'll run and change my dress now. I am afraid the boy is working too hard, said Mrs. Kane, sighing. The days are not half long enough for him, and he keeps in his workshop, or hangar, or whatever you call it, half the night. True, returned Orissa with a laugh but it is not work for Steve, you know, it's play. He's like a child with a new toy. I hope it will not prove a toy in the end, remarked Mrs. Kane gravely. So much depends upon his success. Don't worry, dear, said the girl brightly. Steve is making our fortune, I'm sure. 
But as she discarded the lawn for a dark gingham in her little chamber, Orissa's face was more serious than her words, and she wondered, as she had wondered hundreds of times, whether her brother's great venture would bring them ruin or fortune. End of chapter 1「Chapter Two of the Flying Girl This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason in Panama The Flying Girl by L. Frank Baum Chapter Two Disciple of Aviation the Keynes had come to California some three years previous because of Mr. Keynes' impaired health. He had been the manager of an important manufacturing company in the East on a large salary for many years, and his family had lived royally and his children been given the best education that money could procure. Orissa attended a famous girls' school and Stephen went to college. But suddenly the father's health broke, and his physicians offered no hope for his life unless he at once migrated to a sunny clime where he might be always in the open air. He came to California and invested all his savings, not a great deal, in the Orange Ranch. Three months later he died, leaving his blind wife and two children without any financial resources except what might be gleaned from the ranch. Fortunately, the boy, Stephen, had just finished his engineering course at Cornell and was equipped, theoretically at least, to begin a career with one of the best-paying professions known to modern times. Mechanical to his fingertips, Stephen Kane had eagerly absorbed every bit of information placed before him and had been graduated so well that a fine position was offered him in New York, with opportunity for rapid advancement. Mr. Kane's death prevented the young man from accepting this desirable offer. He was obliged to go to Los Angeles to care for his mother and sister. It was a difficult situation for an inexperienced boy to face, but he attacked the problem with the same manly courage that had enabled him to conquer Euclid and Calculus at school, and in the end arranged his father's affairs fairly well. The oranges from the ranch would give them a net income of about $2,000 per year which was far from meaning poverty, although much less than the family expenditures had previously been. There were other fruits on the place, an ample vegetable garden, and a flock of chickens, so the Canes believed they would live very comfortably on their income. In addition to this, Steve could earn a salary as a mechanical engineer, or at least he believed he could. He found, however, after many unsuccessful attempts, that his professional field was amply covered by experienced men, and as a temporary makeshift he was finally driven to accept a position in an automobile repair shop. "'It's an awful come-down, Riz,' he said to Orisa, his confidant, "'but I can't afford to loaf any longer, you know, and the pay is almost as much as a young engineer gets to start with. So I'll tackle it and keep my eye open for something better.' While Stephen was employed in this repair shop, a famous aviator named Willard came to town with his aeroplane and met with an accident that badly disabled his machine. Although aviators have marked Southern California as their chosen field from the beginning, because one may fly there all winter, there was not a place in the city where a specialty was made of repairing airships. Naturally, Mr. Willard sought an automobile repair shop as the one place most liable to supply his needs. The manager shook his head. We know nothing about biplanes, he confessed. Pardon me, sir, said Stephen Kane, who was present. I know something about airships, and I am sure I can repair Mr. Willard's if you will take the job. The aviator turned to him gratefully. Thank you, he said. I'll put my machine in your hands. What experience have you had with biplanes of this type? None at all, was the answer but I am sure you will not find an experienced airship man in this city. I've studied the devices, though, ever since Montgomery made his first flights, and as we have all the requisite tools and machinery here, I am sure, with your assistance and direction, I can readily put your machine into perfect condition. He did, performing the work excellently. Before long, another biplane needed repairs, and Stephen was recommended by Mr. Willard. Later, a Curtis machine came under Steve's hands, and then an Antoinette monoplane. 
the manager raised the young fellow's salary, proud that he had a man competent to repair these new-fangled inventions which were creating such a stir throughout the country. Stephen Kane might have continued to follow the calling of an expert aeroplane doctor with marked success had he been an ordinary young mechanic, but the air castles he had built at college were not all dissipated, as yet, and aside from possessing decided talent as a workman, Steve had an inventive genius that promised great things for his future. By the time he had taken a half-dozen different aeroplanes apart and repaired them, he had a thorough knowledge of their construction and requirements, and the best of them seemed to him wholly inadequate for the purpose for which they were planned. The fact is, Riz, he said to Arissa one evening, after he had been poring over a book on air currents, the airships of today are all experimental and chock full of mistakes. No two are anywhere near alike, and each man thinks he has the only correct mechanism. But they fly, answered the girl, who was keenly interested in the subject of aviation and had twice been down to the shop to examine the aeroplanes Steve was repairing. So they do, they fly, after a fashion, admitted the young man, which fully proves the thing can be accomplished. But present machines are all too complicated, and the planes seem to have been shaped by guesswork, rather than common sense. They fuss with motors and propellers and ignore the sustaining mechanism, which is the most vital principle of all. Some day we shall see the sky full of successful aviators, and flying will be as common as automobiling now is. But when that time comes, we shall laugh at the crude devices they brag of today. That may be true, returned the girl, thoughtfully. But isn't it true of every great invention that the first models are imperfect? Quite true, said he. I can make a better biplane than any I have seen, but I admit that I had not had the advantage of seeing any I might have blundered as all the rest of them seemed to have done. Why don't you make one, Steve? asked Orissa impulsively. If aviation is going to become general, the man who builds the best aeroplane will make his fortune. Steve flushed and rose to tramp up and down the room before he answered. Then he stopped before his sister and said in low, intense accents, I long to make one, Orissa. The idea has taken possession of my thoughts until it has almost driven me crazy. I can make a machine that will fly better and be more safe and practical than either the Wright or Curtis machines. But the thing is impossible. I... I haven't the money. Orissa sat staring at the rug for a long time. Finally, she asked, How much money would it take, Steve? He hesitated. I don't know. I've never figured it out. What's the use? There is use in everything, declared his sister, calmly. Get to work and figure. Find out how much you need, and then we'll see if we can manage it. He gazed at her as if bewildered. Then he turned and left the room without a word. A few evenings later, he handed her an estimate. I think it could be done for three thousand dollars, he remarked, which means, of course, it can't be done at all. Orissa took the paper without replying and pondered over it for several days. She was only seventeen, but had inherited her father's clear, business-grasping mind, and would have been an essentially practical girl had not her youth and inexperience lent her some illusions that time would dissipate. Stephen posed as the head of the family, but Orissa really directed its finances, poor Miss Kane being so helpless that her children never depended on her for counsel but on the contrary kept all business matters from her, lest she worry over them. The one maid employed in the bungalow served Mrs. Kane almost exclusively, while Orissa always had devoted much time to her mother, who had been stricken blind at the time of her daughter's birth. One evening, when brother and sister were in the garden together, the girl said, I believe I have discovered a plan that will permit you to build your airship. What is it to be, Steve, a biplane or a monoplane? Let me hear your plan, was the eager reply. Well, I've been to see Mr. Wentworth, and he will advance us fifteen hundred on our orange crop by discounting the price ten per cent. He came and looked at the trees and said they were safe to pay us at least $2,300 next February. But, Orissa, how could we live with our income cut down that way, to a mere seven or eight hundred dollars? I'm going to work, she said quietly. I'm tired of doing nothing but dig around the garden and cook. Mama doesn't need me, at least during the day, so I'm going into business. 
Steve smiled. You work, Orissa? What on earth could you do? I'll find something to do, and my salary added to yours will make up for the loss of the orange money. We must economize, of course, but when we've such a big deal on hand, one that will make our fortune, we can put up with a few temporary discomforts. But fifteen hundred won't build the thing, that is certain, he said with a sigh. I've got to construct an entirely new motor, engine and all, and some original propellers and elevators, and the patterns and castings for those will be rather expensive. Well, by the time the fifteen hundred are gone, she replied, you will know exactly how much more money is needed, and we will mortgage the place for that amount. Rubbish, cried Stephen impatiently. I won't listen an instant to such a wild plan. Suppose I fail. Oh, if you're going to fail, we won't undertake it, said his sister. You claimed you could make a better airship than the Curtis or the Wright, either one of which is worth a fortune, and I believed you. If you were only joking, Steve, we won't talk of it any more. I wasn't joking or bragging either, you know that. Orissa, I'm pretty sure of my idea, but it's untried. I've bought all the books on aviation I can find, and I've been reading at Professor Montgomery's discovery of the law of air currents and his theories concerning them. They are only primers, dear, for the science of aviation is as yet unwritten. That is why I cannot speak with perfect assurance, but the more I look into the thing, the more positive I am that I've hit upon the right idea of aerial navigation. What is your idea? she asked. To simplify the construction of the craft, the present devices are all too complicated and keep the aviator too busy while he's in the air. In other words, he's all up in the air while he's up in the air, she remarked. Precisely. Most of his time is required to maintain a lateral balance, so as not to tip over or lose control. I'm to have a simpler construction, an automatic balance, and a plane only large enough to support the machinery and the aviator. If you can manage that, said Orissa, we're not taking any chances. He sat with furrowed brow, thinking deeply. Finally, he said in a decisive way, Nothing is certain until it is accomplished. I won't take the risk of making you and mother paupers. Please don't speak of the thing again, Riz. Orissa didn't, but Steve did, about a month later. A great aviation meet had been arranged at Dominguez Field, near Los Angeles, and only a few miles from their own home. The event, which was destined to be an epoch in the history of aviation, brought many famous aviators to the city with their machines, among them a Frenchman named Paulhan, with whom Stephen soon became acquainted. An examination of Paulhan's machine, a farman of the latest type, which had already performed marvels, served to convince the boy that his own ideas were not only practical, but destined soon to be discovered and applied by someone else if he himself failed to take advantage of the time and opportunity to utilize them. With that argument to calm any misgivings that he might perhaps fail, coupled with an eagerness to build his invention that drove him to forsake caution, Steve went to Orissa one day and said, All right, dear, I'm going to undertake the thing. Can you still get Mr. Wentworth to advance the money? I think so, she replied. Then get it, and I'll start work at once. The drawings are already complete and he showed them to her, neatly traced in comprehensive detail. Most girls would have been bewildered by the technicalities and passed the drawings with a glance, but Orissa understood how important to them all this venture was destined to be, so she sat down and studied the designs minutely, making her brother explain anything she found the least puzzling. By this time the girl had made herself familiar with the latest modern improvements in aeroplanes and had personally examined several of the best devices, so she was able to catch the true value of Stephen's idea and immediately became as enthusiastic as he was. The money was raised and placed by Stephen in a bank where he could draw upon it as he needed it. Mrs. Kane concurred mildly in the plans when they were explained to her, being accustomed to lean upon Orissa and Stephen and to accept their judgment without protest. Aviation was all Greek to the poor woman, and she did not bother her head trying to understand why people wanted to fly or how they might accomplish their desire. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of The Flying Girl This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Luisa Rees, Eugene, Oregon. The Flying Girl by L. Frank Baum. The Cane Aircraft. Stephen set up his workshop at home, devoting his evenings to the new aeroplane. Progress was necessarily slow, as four or five hours out of each twenty-four were all he could devote to his enterprise. The boy was still employed in this manner when the aviation meet was held at Domingo's Field, and Paul Ann accomplished the wonderful flights that made him world famous. Of course, Orissa and Stephen were present and did not miss a single event. On the grandstand beside them sat a young fellow Stephen had often met at the automobile shop, a chauffeur named Arch Hoxie. It was the first time Hoxie had ever seen an aeroplane, and neither he nor Stephen could guess that, within one year, this novice would become the greatest aviator in all the world. These are days when comet-like a heretofore unknown aviator appears, accomplishes marvels, and disappears, eclipsed by some new master of the art of flying. It is the same way with aeroplanes. The leading one today is within a brief period destined to be surpassed by a greatly improved machine. The enthusiasm of the canes rose to fever heat in witnessing this exhibition, at the time the most remarkable ever held in the annals of aviation. Afterward, they counseled together very seriously and agreed that it would be better for Steve to resign his position at the shop and devote his whole time to his aeroplane, in which he had now more confidence than ever. He applied for patents on his various devices and the complete machine, being fearful that someone else might adopt his ideas before he could finish his first aeroplane. Yet, at the same time, he observed the utmost secrecy as to the work on which he was engaged and admitted no person except Orissa to the garden where he had set up his hangar and shop. The girl had been for some time persistently seeking employment, for now that Steve had ceased to be a breadwinner, it was more important than ever for her to earn money. By good fortune, she was engaged by Mr. Burton as his secretary the very week following her brother's retirement. Steve's expenses were growing greater, however, and Orissa began figuring on ways and means. Their life in this retired place was so simple that she believed her mother could do without the maid and questioned her on the subject. Mrs. Kane declared she preferred to be alone if Orissa felt she could prepare the breakfasts and dinners unaided. Luncheons at home were very plain affairs, and Steve readily agreed to come into the house at noon and get a bite for himself and his mother. So the maid was dismissed and a considerable expense eliminated. During the summer, construction of the airship progressed more rapidly and, after the motors were completed and tested and found to be nearly perfect, Stephen began to model the planes and perfect his automatic balance. It was hard work sometimes for Orissa to sit in the office and keep her mind on her work when she knew her brother was completing or testing some important detail of the aeroplane. But she held herself in rigid restraint and succeeded in giving satisfaction to her employer. On the August afternoon on which our story opens, Stephen Kane was to begin the final assembling of the parts of his machine, after which he could test it in real flight. He needed Orissa's assistance to help him handle some of the huge ribbed planes 
so she had promised to come home early. It was not long before she entered the hangar, arrayed in her old gingham which allowed her to move freely. The two became so interested that Mrs. Kane almost missed her dinner in spite of the girl's promise. But Orissa did manage to tear herself away from the fascinating task long enough to prepare the meal and serve it. Steve came in and tried to eat, for he was at a point where he could do nothing without his sister's help. But neither of them was able to swallow more than a morsel, and as quickly as possible hurried back to their work. Mrs. Kane, although totally blind, knew her way about the house perfectly, and was able to take care of herself in nearly all ways. So when bedtime came, she abandoned her monotonous knitting, played a few pieces on the pianoforte, one of her few amusements, and then calmly retired for the night. She never worried over the children, believing they were competent to care for themselves. It was long past midnight before Steve got to a point where he could continue without Orissa. In about three days more, he said, as they washed up and prepared to adjourn to the house, I will be able to make my first flight. Shall we wait till Sunday, Riss, or will you take a day off? Oh, not Sunday, she replied. However eager her brother might be, she had never yet allowed him to work a moment on a Sunday, and Steve deferred to her wishes in this regard. We're pretty busy at the office, and Mr. Burton was inclined to be a little cranky today, but I'll manage it somehow, just as soon as you're ready. What sort of fellow is Burton? asked her brother, somewhat curiously. Why, he stands well in the business world, I'm told, and is very successful in handling large tracts of real estate, she replied. Also, he seems a gentleman by birth and breeding. Yet a queerer man I never met. His chief peculiarity is in being very absent-minded, but he does other odd things. Yesterday he refused to sell a piece of land to a customer because he did not like him, and he told the man so with rude frankness. One day I discovered he had cheated another man out of six hundred dollars. I called his attention to what I described as a mistake, and he said he robbed the man on purpose because he'd been snobbish and overbearing. He gave the six hundred dollars to a poor woman to build her a house with, saying to me that he had once committed a serious crime for which this was in part penance. And soon after, he platted a lot of swamp land down near San Pedro, and advertised it as desirable residence property. Really, Steve, I can't quite make out Mr. Burton. He seems to have good and bad points from what you say, said her brother, and I judge the two qualities are about evenly mixed. Is he nice to you, Riz? He's always polite and respectful, but most of the time he doesn't know I'm in existence. When he gets one of his absorbed fits, his eyes look right through me as if I wasn't there. Perhaps he's thinking out some big schemes. Is he a rich man? He's said to be quite wealthy, but he is an old bachelor, and the girl across the hall says he lives at a club, goes to the theater every night, and drinks more than is good for him. I hardly believe that last, Steve, for Burton doesn't look up bit like a drinking man. Perhaps he's a morphine fiend. That would make him absent-minded, you know. No, when he's aroused, his head is clear as a bell, and he drives a shrewd bargain. Do you know, Steve, I'm inclined to think that speech of his was in earnest, although he laughed harshly at the time, and that, that, that what? that at some time or other he has committed some crime that worries him. End of chapter 3
Chapter Four of the Flying Girl. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Flying Girl by L. Frank Baum. Chapter Four. Mr. Burton is confidential. Orisa was tired next day and she blundered several times in copying deeds and attending to the routine of the private office where she alone was closeted with her proprietor but mr burton would not have noticed had she set fire to the place so intent was he upon a bundle of papers he had brought in with him and to which he devoted his exclusive attention the girl left him at his desk when she went to lunch and found him there still occupied with the papers when she returned several people wanted to see him personally but he told orisa to state he was engaged and could admit no one she gave the message to the young man in charge of the outer office where several clerks were employed and they knew better than to allow anyone to invade mr burton's private sanctum at about three o'clock while she was busy at her desk the secretary heard her name spoken and looked up from his chair mr burton was eyeing her observantly his gaze was clear and intelligent the abstracted mood had passed come here please miss kane he said she brought her writing pad and sat down beside his desk as she did when he dictated his letters but he shook his head will not mind the mail to-day he said i want to talk with you to advise with you queerly enough miss kane there isn't a soul on earth in whom i can confide when occasion arises in other words i haven't an intimate friend i can trust or one who is sincerely interested in me that embarrassed orisa a little since she had been working at the office this was the first time he had addressed a remark to her not connected with business indeed the man was now regarding her much as he would a curiosity as if he had just discovered her she was amazed to hear him speak so confidentially and made no reply because she had nothing to say after a pause he continued you haven't much business experience my child but you have a keen intellect and decided opinions orisa wondered how he knew that therefore i am going to ask your advice in a matter where business is blended with sentiment will you be good enough to give me your candid opinion if you wish me to sir she said after some hesitation thank you miss kane the case is this with four others i purchased some time ago a gold mine in arizona known as the queen of hearts it cost me all i am worth some two hundred thousand dollars orisa gasped it seemed an enormous sum but he continued speaking calmly and clearly i thought at the time the mine was surely worth a million i went to see it and found the ore exceedingly rich the others who purchased the queen of hearts with me were equally deceived for just recently we have discovered that the rich vein was either very narrow or was placed there by those we purchased from with the intention of defrauding us in either case please understand that the mine is not worth a cotton hat we are a stock company and our stock is listed on the exchange and commands a high premium for no one except the owners knows the truth about it the general idea is that the mine is still producing largely and it is for to protect ourselves until we can unload it on to others we have secretly purchased rich ore elsewhere dumped it into the mine and then taken it out again he paused drumming absently on the desk with his fingers and orisa asked what is the object of that deception sir to maintain the public delusion until we can sell out and now i come to the point of my story miss kane gold mines even as rich as the queen of hearts is reputed to be are not easy to sell 
I have exhausted all my resources in keeping up this deception, and the time has come when I must sell or become bankrupt. The other stockholders have smaller interests and are wealthier men, but each one is striving hard to secure a customer. I have found one. He looked up and smiled at her. Then he frowned. The man is my brother-in-law, he added. Orisa was getting nervous, but waited for him to continue. This brother-in-law is a man I detest. He married my only sister and did not treat her well. He is a notorious gambler and confidence man, although perhaps he would not admit that is his profession. At all events, he had the assurance to sneer at me and abuse my sister, and I was powerless at the time to interfere. Fortunately, the poor woman died several years ago. Since then, I have not seen much of Cumberford, for he lives in the East. He came out here last month on some small business matter and has gone crazy over the Queen of Hearts mine. He hunted me up and asked if I'd sell part of my stock. I told him I would sell all or none. So he has been getting his money together and has raised $250,000, the sum I demanded. Orisa was looking at him wonderingly. The story seemed incredible. Perhaps Mr. Burton saw the dismay and reproach in her eyes, for he asked, "'What do you think of this deal, Miss Kane? Am I not fortunate?' "'But you would really sell a worthless property to this man, your own brother-in-law, and, and steal a fortune from him?' she inquired. The man flushed and shifted uneasily in his seat. "'He abused my sister,' he said as if defending himself. "'The property is worthless,' she persisted. "'He can hustle around and sell it again, as I am doing. "'Suppose he fails. "'Suppose he refuses to do such a wicked thing.' Mr. Burton stared at her a moment. Then he laughed harshly. "'Cumberford would delight in such a wicked game,' he replied. "'And if he failed to sell, the scoundrel would be ruined.' for I believe this two hundred and fifty thousand is about all he's worth. It's dreadful, exclaimed the girl, really shocked. It is done every day in a business way, he rejoined. Then why did you ask my advice? demanded the girl quickly. Before answering, he waited to drum on the desk with his fingers again. Because, said he, speaking slowly, I dislike this man so passionately that I have wondered if the hatred blinds my judgment. He may be dangerous, too. Yet I think he is too much of a fool to be able to injure me in retaliation. I don't know him very well. I have not seen him before for years. He paused, taking note of the horror spreading over the girl's face. Then he smiled and added in a gentler voice, Perhaps my chief reason, however, for seeking your advice, is that I find I still have a conscience. Yes, yes, a troublesome conscience. I have been suppressing it for years. Yet, like Banquo's ghost, it will not down. My business judgment determines me to unload this worthless stock and save myself from the loss of my entire fortune. I must do it. It's like a man taking unawares a counterfeit coin, and then, discovering it as spurious, passing it on to some innocent victim. You might do that yourself, Miss Kane. I do not believe I would. Well, most people would, and think it no crime. In this case, I'm merely passing a counterfeit that I received innocently on to another innocent. If the fact is ever known, my business friends will applaud me. But that obstinate conscience of mine keeps asking the question, is it safe? It asserts that I am filled with glee because I am selling to a man I hate, a man who has indirectly injured me. I am to get revenge as well as save my money. Safe? Of course it's safe. Yet my uh, conscience, the, the still small voice, keeps digging at me to be careful. It doesn't seem to like the idea of dealing with Cumberford. 
and has been annoying me for several days so i thought i would put the case to a young pure-minded girl who has a clear head and is honest i imagined you would tell me to go ahead then i could afford to laugh at cautious mr conscience no said orisa gravely the conscience is right but you misunderstood its warning it doesn't mean that the act is not safe from a worldly point of view but from a moral standpoint you could not respect yourself mr burton if you did such a thing he sighed and turned to his papers orisa hesitated then impulsively she asked you won't do it sir will you yes miss kane i think i shall his tone had changed it was now hard and cold mr cumberford will call here to-morrow morning at nine to consummate the deal he continued see that we are not disturbed miss kane but sir he turned upon her almost fiercely but at sight of her distressed downcast face a kindlier look came to his eyes remember that the alternative would be ruin he said gently i would be obliged to give up my business these offices and begin life anew you would lose your position and oh i won't mind that she exclaimed don't you care for it then yes for i need the money i earn but to do right will not ruin either of us sir perhaps not but i am not going to do right as you see it i shall follow my business judgment orisa was indignant i shall save you from yourself then she cried standing before him like an accusing angel i warn you now mr burton that when mr cumberford calls i shall tell him the truth about your mine and then he will not buy it he looked at her curiously reflectively for a long time as if he beheld for the first time some rare and admirable thing the man was not angered he seemed not even annoyed by her threat but after that period of disconcerting study he turned again to his desk thank you miss kane that is all she went back to her post trembling nervously from the excitement of the interview and tried to put her mind on her work but mr burton was wholly unemotional and seemed to have forgotten her presence but a half hour later when he thrust the papers into his pocket locked his desk and took his hat to go he paused beside his secretary gazed earnestly into her face a moment and then abruptly turned away good night miss kane he said and his voice seemed to dwell tenderly on her name end of chapter four Chapter Five of the Flying Girl. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Luisa Ruiz, Eugene, Oregon. The Flying Girl by L. Frank Baum. Chapter Five. Between Man and man and a girl that night orissa confided the whole story to steve her brother listened thoughtfully and then inquired will you really warn mr cumberford riz i i ought to she faltered then do he returned to my notion burton is playing a mean trick on the fellow and no good businessman would either applaud or respect him for it your employer is shifty orissa i'm sure of it if i were you i'd put a stop to this game no matter what came of it very well steve i'll do it but i don't believe mr burton means to be a bad man his plea about his conscience proves that but but it's worse for a man to realize he's doing wrong and then do it than if he were too hardened to have any conscience at all asserted steve oracularly 
and if I let him do this wrong act, I would be as guilty as he, she added. That's true, Riz. You'll lose your job, sure enough, but there will be another somewhere just as good. So when Mr. Burton's secretary went to the office next morning, she was keyed up to do the most heroic deed that had ever come to her hand. Whatever the consequences might be, the girl was determined to waylay Mr. Cumberford when he arrived and tell him the truth about the Queen of Hearts. But he did not come to the office at nine o'clock. Neither had Mr. Burton arrived at that time. Arissa, her heart beating with trepidation but strong in resolve, watched the clock nearing the hour, passing it, and steadily ticking on in the silence of the office. The outer room was busy this morning, and in the broker's absence, his secretary was called upon to perform many minor tasks, but her mind was more upon the clock than upon her work. Ten o'clock came. Eleven. At half-past eleven, the door swung open, and Mr. Burton ushered in a strange gentleman whom Arissa at once decided was Mr. Cumberford. He was extremely tall and thin and stooped somewhat as he walked. He had a long, grizzled mustache, wore gold-rimmed eyeglasses, and carried a gold-headed cane. From his patent leather shoes to his chamois gloves, he was as neat and sleek as if about to attend a reception. Observing the presence of a young lady, the stranger at once removed his hat, showing his head to be perfectly bald. "'Sit down, Cumberford,' said Mr. Burton carelessly. As he obeyed, Orissa, her face flaming red, advanced to a position before him and exclaimed in a pleading voice, "'Oh, sir, do not buy Mr. Burton's mine. I beg of you.' The man stared at her with faded gray eyes, which were enlarged by the lenses of his spectacles. Mr. Burton smiled, seemed interested, and watched the scene with evident amusement. Oh, "'Why not, my child?' asked Mr. Cumberford. "'Because it is worthless, absolutely worthless,' she declared. He turned to the other man. "'Eh, Burton?' he muttered inquiringly. "'Miss Kane believes she's speaking the truth,' said the broker jauntily. "'Oh, she does. And you, Burton?' "'I? Why, I'm of the same opinion.' Mr. Cumberford took out his handkerchief, removed his glasses, and polished the lenses with a thoughtful air. Orissa was trembling with nervousness. "'Don't buy the Queen of Hearts, sir. It would ruin you,' she repeated earnestly." He breathed upon the glasses and wiped them carefully. "'You interest me,' he remarked. "'But the fact is, I, er, I've i bought it.' "'Already?' "'At nine o'clock, according to agreement. Burton sent word he'd come to my hotel instead of meeting me at his office as first planned. "'Oh, I see,' cried Orissa, much disappointed. "'He knew I would prevent the crime.' "'Crime, miss? "'Is it not a crime to rob you of two hundred and fifty thousand dollars? "'It would be, of course. "'I should dislike to lose so much money.' "'You have lost it,' declared the girl. "'That mine has no gold in it at all, "'except what has been bought elsewhere and placed in it to deceive a purchaser.' "'Mr. Cumberford replaced his glasses,' adjusting them carefully upon his nose. Then he stared at Orissa again. "'You're an honest young woman,' he said calmly. "'I'm much obliged. You interest me. But, <clears throat> Burton has my money, you see.' Mr. Burton's expression had changed. He was now regarding his brother-in-law with a curious and puzzled gaze. "'You're not angry, Cumberford?' he asked. "'No, Burton. "'You're not even annoyed, I take it?' "'This was something of a sneer. "'No, Burton.' "'Both Arissa and her employer were amazed. "'Looking from one to another, 
Mr. Cumberford's waxen features relaxed into a smile. I've placed my Queen of Hearts stock in a safety deposit vault, he remarked blandly. I've deposited your money in my bank, retorted Mr. Burton triumphantly. Excellent, said the other. The thing interests me. Indeed, it does. You couldn't purchase that stock from me at this moment, Burton, for twice the sum I paid you. No, and why not? I'll tell you. I had not intended to refer to the matter just yet, but this young woman's expose of your attempted trickery induces me to explain matters. You've always taken me for a fool, Burton. I've tried to place a proper value on your intellect, Cumberford. You have little talent in that line, believe me. Before I came out here, I had heard such glowing reports of the Queen of Hearts that I stopped off in Arizona to see the wonderful mine. The manager was very polite and showed me about, but somehow I got a notion that not all was square and above board. I've always been interested in mines. They fascinate me. And if this mine was as rich as reported, I wanted some of the stock. But I imagined things looked a little queer. So I sent a confidential agent, a fellow named Brewster, who's been with me for years, to hire out as a miner and keep his eyes open. He soon discovered the truth, that the mine was being salted or fed with outside gold ore in precisely the way this girl has stated. He turned to Orissa with a profound bow, then looked toward Burton again. The thing interested me. I wondered why, and wired my man to stay on a little longer till I had time to think it over. I, er, think very slowly. Very. In a few days, Brewster telegraphed me the startling intelligence that the mine had actually struck a new lead, with ore far richer than the first showing, although that had made the Queen of Hearts famous. My man had been sent to the telegraph office with messages from the manager to Mr. Burton and the four other stockholders. But poor Brewster's memory is bad, and he forgot to send a telegram to anyone but me. Of course, the great strike er, interested me. I instructed Brewster over the telegraph wire. At a cost of $5,000, he bribed the manager to keep the valuable strike secret for 10 days. He's an honest man, and I shall retain him in the office. The 10 days expire tonight. Meantime, I have purchased the stock. Mr. Burton sprang to his feet, white with anger. You scoundrel! he shouted. Don't get excited, Burton. This is a mere business incident between man and man and a girl. Another bow towards Arissa. You tried to rob me, sir, and sneered when you thought you had succeeded. I haven't robbed you, for I paid your price. But I've made a very neat investment. My stock is worth a million at this moment. Interesting, isn't it? Mr. Burton recovered himself with an effort and sat down again. Very well, he said a little thickly. As you say, it's all in the way of business. Good day, Cumberford. The other man arose and faced Arissa, who stood by wholly bewildered by this unexpected development. Thank you again, my child. Your name? Arissa Kane. I'll remember it. You tried to do me a kindness. Interesting. Very. Without another glance at Mr. Burton, he put on his hat, walked out, and closed the door softly behind him. Orissa looked up and found the broker's eyes regarding her intently. Uh, I'm sorry, sir, she stammered, but I had to do it to satisfy my conscience. I suppose I'm dismissed. No, indeed, Miss Kane, 
he returned in kindly tones. An honest secretary is too rare an acquisition to be dismissed without just cause. Having told you what I did, I could expect you to act in no other way. And after all, sir, she said, brightening at the thought, you did not rob him, yet you saved your fortune. He made a slight grimace, then laughed frankly. <laughs> Had I taken your advice, he rejoined, I should now be worth a million. End of chapter 5、Chapter、six of The Flying Girl. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Flying Girl by L. Frank Baum. Chapter Six A Bucking Biplane. Stephen Kane had scarcely slept a wink for three nights. When Orissa came home Thursday evening, he met her at the car with the news that his aeroplane was complete. I've been adjusting it and testing the working parts all the afternoon, he said, his voice tense with effort to restrain his excitement. And I'm ready for the trial, whenever you say. All right, Steve. She replied briskly. It begins to be daylight at about half past four this time of year. Shall we make the trial at that hour tomorrow morning? I couldn't wait longer than that, he admitted, pressing her arm as they walked along. My idea is to take it into old Marston's pasture. Isn't the bull there? she inquired. Not now. Marston has kept the bull shut up for the past few days, and it's the best place for the trial, for there's lots of room. Let's take a look at it, Steve, she said, hastening her steps. In the big canvas covered shed reposed the aeroplane, its spreading white sails filling the place almost to the very edges. It was neither a monoplane nor a biplane, according to accepted ideas of such machines, but was what Steve called a story and a half flyer. That is, I hope it's a flyer, he amended, while Orissa stared with admiring eyes, although she already knew every stick and stitch by heart. Of course it's a flyer, she exclaimed. I wouldn't be afraid to mount to the moon in that airship. All that witch is neat as a broomstick, he said playfully. But perhaps you're not that sort of a witch, little sister. What shall we call it, Steve? she asked seriously. Of course it's a biplane, because there are really two planes, one being above the other, but it is not in the same class with other biplanes. We must have a distinctive name for it. I've thought of calling it the Kane Aircraft, he answered. How does that strike you? It has an original sound, Orissa said. Oh, Steve, couldn't we try tonight? It's moonlight. He shook his head quickly, smiling at her enthusiasm. I'm afraid not. You're tired and have the dinner to get and the day's dishes to wash and put away. As for me, I'm so dead for sleep, I can hardly keep my eyes open. I must rest so as to have a clear head for tomorrow's flight. Shall we say anything to Mother about it? Why need we? It would only worry the dear woman unnecessarily. Whether I succeed or fail in this trial, it will be time enough to break the news to her afterwards. Orissa agreed with this. Mrs. K knew the airship was nearing completion, but was not especially interested in the venture. It seemed wonderful to her that mankind had at least learned how to fly, and still more wonderful that her own son was inventing and building an improved appliance for this purpose. But so many marvelous things had happened since she became blind that her mind was to an extent inured to astonishment. And she had learned to accept with calm complacency anything she could not comprehend. Brother and sister at last tore themselves away from the fascinating creation and returned to the house, where Steve, thoroughly exhausted, fell asleep in his chair while Orissa was preparing dinner. He went to bed almost immediately after he had eaten, and his sister also retired when her mother did, which was at an early hour. But Orissa could not sleep. She lay and dreamed of the great triumph before them. Of the plaudits of enraptured spectators, of Stephen's name on every tongue in the civilized world, and not least by any means, of the money that would come to them. No longer would the Canes have to worry over debts and due bills. The good things of the world would be theirs, all won by her brother's cleverness. If she slept at all before the gray dawn stole into the sky, the girl was not aware of it. By half past four, she had smoking hot coffee ready for Steve and herself, and after hastily drinking it, they rushed to the hangar. Steve was bright and alert this morning and declared he had slept like a log. 
he slid the curtains away from the front of the shed and solemnly the boy and girl wheeled the big aeroplane out into the garden by careful manipulation they steered it between the trees and away to the fence of marston's pasture which adjoined their own premises at the rear to get it past the fence had been steve's problem and he had arranged to take out a section of the fencing big enough to admit his machine this was now but a few minutes work and presently the aeroplane was on the smooth turf of the pasture they were all alone there were no near neighbors and it was early for any to be astir one of the most important improvements i have made is my starting device said steve as he began a last careful examination of his aircraft all others have a lot of trouble in getting started the right people erect a tower and windlass and nearly every other machine uses a track i know replied orissa i have seen several men holding the thing back until the motors got well started and the propellers were whirling at full speed that always struck me as a crude arrangement observed her brother now in this machine i start the motor whirling an eccentric of the same resisting power as the propeller yet it doesn't affect the stability of the aeroplane when i'm ready to start i throw in a clutch that instantly transfers the power from the eccentric to the propeller and away i go like a rocket as he spoke he kissed his sister and climbed to the seat are you afraid steve she whispered her beautiful face flushed and her eyes bright with excitement afraid of my own machine of course not don't go very high dear we'll see i want to give it a thorough test all right riss i'm off the motors whirred steadily accelerating speed while the aeroplane trembled as if eager to dart away steve threw in the clutch the machine leaped forward and ran on its wheels across the pasture like a deer but did not rise he managed to stop at the opposite fence and when orissa came running up panting her brother sat in his place staring stupidly ahead what's wrong steve he rubbed his head and woke up the forward elevator i guess but i'm sure i had it adjusted properly he got down and examined the rudder giving it another upward tilt now i'll try it again he said cheerfully they turned the aircraft around and he made another start this time orissa was really terrified for the thing acted just like a bucking bronco it rose to a height of six feet dove to the ground rose again to plunge its nose into the turf and performed such absurd unexpected antics that steve had to cling on for dear life when he finally managed to bring it to a halt the rudder was smashed and two ribs of the lower plane splintered they looked at the invention with dismay both silent for a time of course said steve struggling to restrain his disappointment we couldn't expect it to be perfect at the first trial no agreed orissa faintly but it ought to fly you know being a flying machine it ought to she said can you mend it steve to be sure but it will take me a little time tomorrow morning we will try again with grave faces they wheeled it back into the garden and the boy replaced the fence then back to the hangar where steve put the cane aircraft in its old place and drew the curtains much as one does at a funeral i'm sure to discover what's wrong he told orissa regaining courage as they walked towards the house and if i've made a blunder this is the time to rectify it tomorrow it will be sure to fly have faith in me riss i have she replied simply i'll go and get breakfast now end of chapter six recording by ellie at storiesbyellie dot com Chapter Seven of the Flying Girl. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Flying Girl by L. Frank Baum. Chapter Seven. Something Wrong. All that day. Orissa was in a state of great depression. Even Mr. Burthon noticed her woebegone face and inquired if she were ill. The girl had staked everything on Steve's success, and until now had not permitted a doubt to creep into her mind. But the behavior of the aircraft was certainly not reassuring, and for the first time she faced the problem of what would happen if it proved a failure they would be ruined financially the place would have to be sold worst of all her brother's chagrin and disappointment might destroy his youthful ambition 
and leave him a wreck somehow the girl managed to accomplish her work that day and at evening weary and despondent returned to her home when she left the car her step was slow and dragging until steve came running to meet her his face was beaming as he exclaimed i found the trouble riss it was all my stupidity i put a pin in the front elevator while i was working at it and forgot to take it out again no wonder it wouldn't rise it just couldn't orissa felt as if a great weight had been lifted from her shoulders are you sure it will work now she asked breathlessly it's bound to work i've planned all right that i know and having built the aircraft to do certain things it can't fail to do them provided he added more soberly i haven't overlooked anything else are the repairs completed steve all is an apple pie order for tomorrow morning's test it was a dreadfully long evening for them both but after going to bed orissa was so tired and relieved in spirit that she fell into a deep sleep that lasted until steve knocked at her door at early dawn saturday morning he remarked as together they went out to the hangar do you suppose yesterday being friday had anything to do with our hard luck no it was only that forgotten pin she declared again they wheeled the aircraft out to marston's pasture and once more the girl's heart beat high with hope and excitement steve took a final look at every part although he had already inspected his work with great care then he sprang into the seat and said all right little sister wish me luck the motor whirred faster and faster the clutch gripped the propeller and away darted the aircraft it whirled halfway across the pasture then lifted and began mounting into the air orissa stood with her hands clasped over her bosom straining her eyes to watch every detail of the flight straight away soared the aircraft swift as a bird until it was a mere speck in the gray sky the girl could not see the turn for the circle made was scarcely noticeable at that distance but suddenly she was aware that steve was returning the speck became larger the sails visible the young aviator passed over the pasture at a height of a hundred feet from the ground circled over their own garden and then began to descend as he did so the aircraft assumed a rocking motion side to side which increased so dangerously that orissa screamed without knowing that she did so down came the aeroplane reaching the earth on a side tilt that crushed the light planes into kindling wood and a mass of crumpled canvas steve rolled out stretched his length upon the ground and lay still the sun was just beginning to rise over the orange grove the deathly silence that succeeded the wreck of the aircraft was only broken by the irregular spasmodic whir of the motors which were still going orissa white and cold crept in among the debris and shut down the engines then slowly and reluctantly she approached the motionless form of her brother to be alone at such a time and place was dreadful a few steps from steve she halted then turned and fled towards the garden in sudden panic away from the horrid scene her courage and presence of mind speedily returned she caught up a bucket of water that stood in the shed and lugged it back to the pasture was steve dead she leaned over him dreading to place her hand upon his heart gazing piteously into his set unresponsive face pat pat patter a rush across the springing turf what was it orissa straightened up yelled like an indian and made a run for the fence that did full credit to her athletic training for marston's big bull was coming a huge tawny creature with a temper that would shame tabasco he swerved as if to follow the fleeing girl but then the draggled planes of the aircraft defied him and he changed his mind to charge this new and unknown enemy perhaps with the same disposition that don quixote attacked the windmill orissa shrieked again for the enormous beast bounded directly over steve's prostrate body and with bowed head and tail straight as a pointer's dogs rushed at the aeroplane the sails shivered collapsed rolled in billows like the waves of the ocean and amid them the struggling bull went down tangled himself in the wires and became a helpless prisoner 
the girl who was sobbing hysterically heard herself laugh aloud and was inexpressibly shocked the bull bellowed with rage but was so wound around with guy wires that this was the extent of his power turning her eyes from the beast to steve she gave a shout of joy for her brother was sitting up and rubbing his leg with one hand and his head with the other while he stared bewildered at the wreck of his aeroplane from which the head of the bull protruded Arissa ran up wringing her hands and asked are you much hurt dear I, I, i've gone crazy he answered despairingly seems as if the aircraft was transformed into the mummy of a a brute beast don't laugh for us what's wrong with me with my eyes tell me she threw herself down upon the grass and laughed until she cried steve's reproachful glances having no particle of effect in restraining her when at last she could control herself she sat up and wiped her eyes saying forgive me dear it's so funny but suddenly grave and anxious are you badly hurt is anything broken nothing but my heart he replied dolefully oh that she said relieved just look at that mess he wailed pointing to the aircraft what has happened to it the bull she answered but don't be discouraged dear the thing flew beautifully the bull no the aircraft but as for the bull i am bound to say he did his best how in the world shall we get him out of there steve i i think i'm dazed Riss, he murmured feeling his head again can you help me to understand so she told him the whole story stephen sighing and shaking his head as he glared at the bull and the bull glared at him afterward the boy made an effort to rise and Arissa leaned down and assisted him when he got to his feet she held him until he grew stronger and could stand alone i'm so grateful you were not killed his sister whispered nothing else matters since you have so miraculously escaped killed said steve why it was only a tumble wrist but the bull is a more serious complication i suppose the aircraft was badly damaged from what you say before the bull got it but now it's a hopeless mess oh no she returned encouragingly if he hasn't smashed the motor we won't mind the rest of the damage do you think we can untangle him they approached the animal who by this time was fully subdued and whined apologetically to be released steve got his nippers and cut wire after wire until suddenly the animal staggered to his feet gave a terrified bellow and dashed down the field with a dozen yards of plain cloth wound around his neck good riddance cried Arissa. i don't think he'll ever bother us again steve was examining the wreck he tested the motors and found that neither the fall nor the bull had damaged them in the least but there was breakage enough aside from this to make him groan disconsolately the flight was wonderful commented his sister watching his face anxiously nothing could work more perfectly than the cane aircraft did until until the final descent what caused the rocking steve a fault of the lateral balance my automatic device refused to work and before i knew it i had lost control she stood gazing thoughtfully down at the wreck her brother had really invented a flying machine of that there was no doubt she had seen it fly seen it soar miles through the air and knew that a certain degree of success had been obtained there was something wrong to be sure there usually is with new inventions but wrongs can be righted i've succeeded in a lot of things her brother was saying reflectively the engines the propeller and elevator are all good and decided improvements on the old kinds the starting device works beautifully and will soon be applied to every airship made only the automatic balance failed me and i believe i know how to remedy that fault do you suppose the machine can be rebuilt she asked assuredly and the automatic balance perfected the trouble is Arissa, it will take a lot more money to do it and we've already spent the last cent we could raise it's hard luck here is a certain fortune within our grasp if we could perfect the thing and our only stumbling block is the lack of a few dollars having reviewed in her mind all the circumstances of steve's successful flight the girl knew that he spoke truly comparing the aircraft with other machines she had seen and studied at the aviation meet 
she believed her brother's invention was many strides in advance of them all the question of securing the money is something we must seriously consider she said in some way it will be raised of course but just now our chief concern is how to get this ruin back to the hangar that will be my job declared steve his courage returning there are few very big pieces left to remove and by taking things apart i shall be able to get it all into the shed the day's doings are over Riss. get breakfast and then go to your work after i've stored this rubbish i'll take a run into town myself and look for a job the aviation jig is up for the present at least don't do anything hurriedly steve protested the girl work on the aircraft for a day or two just as if we had money to go ahead with that will give me time to think tonight when i come home we will talk of this again end of chapter 7 recording by ellie at storiesbyellie.com chapter 8 of the flying girl this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the flying girl by l frank baum chapter 8 mr burthon's proposition saturday was a busy day at the office they did not close early but rather later than on other days and orissa found plenty of work to occupy her but always there remained in her thoughts the problem of how to obtain money for steve and she racked her brain to find some practical solution mr burthon was in a mellow mood to-day since the sale of his mining stock he had been less abstracted and moody than before and during the afternoon having just handed orissa several deeds of land to copy he noticed her pale drawn face and said you look tired miss kane she gave him one of her sweet bright smiles in payment for the kindly tone i am tired she returned for two mornings i have been up at four o'clock anyone ill at home he asked quickly no sir suddenly it occurred to her that he might assist in unraveling the problem she turned to him and said can you spare me a few minutes mr burthon i i, I want to ask your advice he glanced at her curiously and sat down in a chair facing her tell me all about it he said encouragingly not long ago it was i asking for advice and you were good enough to favor me now it is logically your turn my brother said she has invented an airship he gave a little start of surprise and an eager look spread over his face then he smiled at her tolerantly all the world has gone crazy over aviation he remarked i myself witnessed the flights at dominguez field and became strongly impressed with the desire to fly i suppose your brother contracted the fever too and has made a model he thinks will float in the air oh it is not a model she gravely replied stephen is an expert mechanic and has worked on many of the most famous aeroplanes in the country he has recently built a complete airship of his own and this morning i watched him make a very successful flight in it indeed he exclaimed the eager look returning there is money in a good airship miss kane this is the psychological moment to forge ahead in aviation which will soon become the world's popular mode of transit it is easy to build an airship yes perhaps i could build one myself but where many will try many will fail and some will succeed she added smiling he examined her expressive face with interest please tell me all about it said he so orissa gave him the history of the aircraft from its conception to the final triumph and wreckage and its conquest by the bull incidentally she told how they had mortgaged their home and the orange crop to get the needed money and finally explained the condition they were now in success within their grasp but no means of taking advantage of it mr burthon was very attentive throughout his eyes fixed upon orissa's lovely face and watching its shades of anxiety and exultation as the story progressed while she enthusiastically described steve's aircraft her eyes sparkling and a soft flush mantling her cheeks the man scarcely heard what she said so intent was he in admiring her he did not permit his fair secretary to notice his mood however and the girl was too earnestly engaged to heed her employer's intent gaze at the conclusion of her story she asked tell me sir 
Is there any way in which we can raise the money required? Mr. Burthon roused himself, and the hard business expression settled upon his features again. I think so, he returned slowly. What your brother needs is a backer, what is called an angel, you know, who will furnish the necessary funds for the perfection of the invention and to place it upon the market and properly exhibit it. Would anyone do that? she inquired. For a consideration, yes. Such a party would demand an interest in the invention and a share of the profits. How much, sir? Perhaps a half-interest? She considered this statement. That is too much to give away, Mr. Burthon. The aircraft is already built and tested. It is a proved success, and the best aeroplane in all the world. Why should we give a half-interest in return for a little money? He hesitated, then replied coldly. Because the invention is useless without the means to publicly demonstrate it, and establish it on a paying basis. At present, your airship is without the slightest commercial value. Once exploited, the half-interest you retain would make your fortune. Her brow wrinkled with a puzzled look. I'll talk to Steve about it, she said. But if he consents, where could I find such an... an angel? In me, he answered coolly. If, on investigation, I find your brother's airship to be one half as practical as you represent it, and doubtless believe it to be, I will deposit ten thousand dollars in the bank to exploit it, in return for a half interest, and agree to furnish more money whenever it is required. Thank you, sir, said Orissa doubtfully. I I'll talk with my brother. Very well, he replied. But beware of confiding in strangers. I am your friend, and will guard your interests faithfully. Talk with your brother, but with no one else. Orissa did talk with Steve that very evening, and the boy frowned at the suggestion, just as his sister had done. "'I know that is the way businessmen do things,' he said. "'And it's a good deal like robbery. Burthon sees that we must have money, and he's driving a shrewd bargain. Besides that, I'm not sure he's honest.' "'I don't see how he could defraud us, though,' mused Orissa. "'There are two things for us to consider. One is whether we can raise the money in any other way.' And then whether a half-interest in a business with plenty of money behind it would not pay better than the whole thing, with a constant struggle to make both ends meet. Perhaps it might, he replied hesitatingly. But I've done all this alone so far, and I hate to let anyone else reap the benefit of my ideas. I suppose if I had not proved the thing, but merely begun work on it, Burthon wouldn't have invested a dollar in it. I suppose not, she agreed. But think it over, dear. We have all day tomorrow to talk of it, and consider what is best to be done. Then when I go to the office Monday morning, I can tell Mr. Burthon our decision. They talked considerably more on this subject after dinner, and worried over it during a sleepless night. After breakfast on Sunday morning, they went quietly to church, Mrs. Kane accompanying them, as was her custom. But Orissa had hard work to keep her mind on the service, and Steve found the attempt impossible. The return home, including a long car ride, was passed in silence, and then Orissa had to busy herself over the dinner. It was the middle of the afternoon before brother and sister found time to meet in the hangar, which was now strewn with parts of the aircraft. Steve looked around him gloomily, and then seated himself beside Orissa upon a bench. "'I suppose we must settle this thing,' he said. "'And there is no doubt we must have money, or we shall face ruin.' The thing has cost too much for us to withdraw from it without a heavy loss that would mean privation and suffering for you and mother. If we go to anyone but Burton, we may not get as good an offer as he makes, for men with money are eager to take advantage of a poor fellow in need. I can't blame Burton much. I don't suppose there's a rich man living who wouldn't hold us up in the same selfish way. And so... He paused, shrugging his shoulders. So, you think we'd better accept Mr. Burton's proposition? "'And give him a half-interest? she asked. "'Beg pardon,' said a cold voice. "'Am I intruding?' End of chapter 8 Recording by Ellie At storiesbyellie.com Chapter 9 of The Flying Girl This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Flying Girl by L. Frank Baum Chapter 9 The Other Fellow 
Stephen and Arissa both sprang to their feet, startled by the interruption. A tall man having a stoop to his shoulders had parted the entrance curtains and stood looking at them. He wore blue goggles, an automobile cap and duster, and heavy shoes. But Orissa recognized him at once. "'Mr. Cumberford!' she exclaimed. "'Dear me,' said the man. "'It's the young lady from Burton's office. And my friend,' he laughed lightly, as if amused by the recollection, then added, "'I've run out of gasoline and my car is stranded a quarter of a mile off. Think you could furnish me enough of the elusive fluid to run me into town?' Steve walked silently to his gasoline tank. He was excessively annoyed to have a stranger spy upon his workshop and resolved to get rid of the man in short order. Orissa also was silent, fearing Mr. Cumberford might linger if she entered into conversation with him. The spot was so retired that until now no one but themselves had ever entered the hangar, and the secret had been well kept. "'Here's a two-gallon can,' said Stephen surlily. "'Will that do you?' Mr. Cumberford nodded, set the can upon the ground, and walked over to the bench, where he calmly seated himself beside the girl. "'What are you up to here?' he asked. "'Our own especial business,' retorted Steve. "'You will pardon me, sir, if I ask you to take your gasoline and go. This is private property.' "'I see,' said Cumberford. "'I'm intruding. Never mind that. Let's talk a bit. I'm in no hurry.' "'We are very much occupied, sir,' urged Orissa earnestly. "'No doubt,' said the man. "'I overheard a remark as I entered. You were wondering whether to accept Burton's offer and give him a half-interest, eh? That interests me. I'm Burton's brother-in-law. He glanced around him, then calmly took a cigarette from his pocket and offered one to Steve. I can't allow smoking here, sir. There's too much gasoline about, said the boy almost rudely. True. I, I forgot. He put the case in his pocket. You're building some sort of a, a flying machine, I see. That interests me. I'm a crank on aviation. Is this the thing Burton wants a half interest in? Steve scowled. When Cumberford turned to Orissa, she slightly nodded embarrassed how to escape this impertinent questioning. I thought so. Then you've really got something. Steve laughed. His annoyance was passing. The man had already seen whatever there was to see, for his eyes had been busy from the moment he entered, and Steve remembered that this was the person who had outwitted Mr. Burthon in the mine deal. I have something that'll fly, if that is what you mean, he replied. Yes, that is what I mean. Tried the thing yet? Oh, yes, said Orissa eagerly. It flew splendidly yesterday morning, but but Steve had an accident with his aeroplane, and a bull demolished what was left of it. Ah, that interests me, it really does, said Cumberford. He looked at Stephen more attentively. Your brother, Miss Kane? Yes, sir. And you need money? To rebuild the machine and perfect it, yes, sir. And Burton will furnish the money for a half interest? Yes, sir repeated the girl, uneasy at his tone. "'Too much,' asserted Mr. Cumberford positively. "'Burton's a rascal, too. You know that, Miss Kane. Tried to rob me, and you tried to prevent him. I haven't forgotten that. It was a kindness. I've had to fight a cold, hard, selfish world, and fight it alone. I've won, but it has made me as cold, as hard, and selfish as the others. You're different, Miss Kane. The world hasn't spoiled you yet.' I can't recollect when anyone ever took the trouble to do me a kindness before. So I, your direct opposite, admire you for your originality. I'm a scoundrel, and you're an, an honest girl. There wasn't a particle of emotion in his voice, but somehow both Orissa and Stephen knew he was in earnest. It was difficult to say anything fitting in a reply, and after a brief pause the man continued, I can see that your airship is at present something of a wreck. How much money do you need? I ought to have at least a thousand dollars, answered Steve, reflectively glancing around the shop. Cumberford's eyes followed his. Will two thousand do it? Of course, sir. I'll lend you three, said the man. I don't want a half interest. I won't rob you. Both boy and girl stared at him in amazement. What security do you require? asked Stephen suspiciously. Eh? None at all. The thing interests me. If you make a lot of money, I'll let you pay me back some day. That's fair. If you fail, you'll have worries enough without having to repay me. But I attach two conditions to my offer. One is that you have nothing to do with Burton. The other is that I have permission to come here and watch you work, to advise with you at times, to help you map out your future career, and to attend all the flying exhibitions in which you take part. Agree to that, and I'll back you through thick and thin, because I'm interested in aviation, and because your sister was good to me. 
I'll do it, sir, cried Steve excitedly. Oh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Cumberford, added Orissa in joyful tones. It's a bargain, said Cumberford, smiling at them both. He took out a fountain pen and wrote a check on the Los Angeles bank for $3,000 in favor of Stephen Kane, but he handed it to Orissa. Now then, said he, tell me something about it. End of chapter 9 Recording by Ellie at storiesbyellie.com Chapter 10 of The Flying Girl This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Flying Girl by L. Frank Baum Chapter 10 A Fresh Start When Orissa appeared at the office Monday morning, she went quietly about her work, feeling very happy indeed. The astonishing generosity of Mr. Cumberford had relieved all her worries and brought sunshine into her heart. Mr. Burton came at his usual time and, on taking his place at the desk, looked inquiringly at Orissa, but said nothing. Neither did she mention the subject of the aircraft. Her employer, watching her stealthily from behind his desk, could not fail to note the joy in her face and was undoubtedly puzzled to account for it, unless, indeed, she and her brother had decided to accept his proposition. He had an idea that they would accept that they must accept. It was the only way they could carry on their experiment. But he waited for her to refer to the subject. Orissa managed to escape that night while a customer was engaging Mr. Burton's attention. She disliked, for some unexplained reason, to tell him they had decided not to take him for a partner. Arriving home, she found Steve busily at work rebuilding his airship, and it pleased her to hear his cheery whistle as she approached the hangar. The young fellow was in capital spirits. "'You see, Riss,' said he, "'with all this money to use, I shall be able to make an entirely new automatic balance. I've come to the conclusion the first one doesn't work smoothly enough to be entirely satisfactory. I shall also provide a store of extra ribs and such parts as are liable to get damaged, so that the repair work will be a matter of hours instead of days. How lucky it was Mr. Cumberford ran out of gasoline yesterday!' "'He's a queer man,' replied Orissa thoughtfully. I can't make up my mind yet whether I like him or not. I like his money anyhow, laughed Steve. And we didn't have to give him a half interest to get it either. I imagine the man was really touched by your endeavor to save him from what you thought was a bad bargain. And certainly his magnanimous act could have been prompted by nothing but kindness. It saved our half interest at least, she said evasively. Has he been here today, Steve? Haven't seen even his shadow, was the reply. I don't imagine he'll bother us much, although he has reserved the right to look around all he wants to. He must be a busy man with all his wealth. The next morning, however, after Orissa had gone to her work, Mr. Cumberford's car spun up the lane and he came into the hangar, nodded to Steve, and sat down quietly on the bench. For a time he silently watched the young man shave a cypress rib into shape, then got up and carefully examined the motor, which was in good order. Steve knew when first Mr. Cumberford began asking questions that he understood machinery, and the man was quick to perceive the value of young Kane's improvements. It interests me, he drawled after starting the engines and watching them work. As a boy, I longed to be a mechanic. Got sidetracked, though, and became a speculator. Needs almost as much ingenuity to succeed in that as in mechanics. Pays better, but ruins one's self-respect. Stick to mechanics, Kane. I will promised Steve, laughing. This new profession, continued Cumberford, will throw you in with a lot of queer people, same sort that used to follow the races and now bet on automobile contests. Keep your sister away from them. I'll try to, returned Steve more soberly. But Orissa is crazy over aviation, and she'll have to go everywhere that I do. That's all right. I like the idea. But don't introduce her to every fellow you are forced to associate with. Girls are queer, and your sister is beautiful. I have a daughter myself. Oh, exclaimed Steve, not knowing just how to take this remark. My daughter is not beautiful. No, and she's a demon. I'll bring her here to see you and your sister some day. Thank you, said Steve, turning red. Certainly this new acquaintance was odd and unaccountable in some ways. Steve wondered why he should bring a demon to the hangar, and why he described his own daughter in such uncomplimentary language. 
Mr. Cumberford smoked a cigarette thoughtfully. Your sister, he said, interests me. She's a good girl. Must have a good mother. The best in the world, asserted Steve proudly. My daughter, resumed Cumberford, takes after her mother. Girls usually do. Her mother was, well, she was birth and sister. Catch the idea? Was all my fault, and Sybil, that's my daughter, blames me for her parentage. With apparent justice. Not a joke, Kane, don't laugh. I'm not laughing, sir. Speaking of birth and reminds me of something. I don't like the idea of your sister working there. In his office. He has always treated her very nicely, I believe, said Steve. And Arissa feels she must earn some money. Not necessary. You have fortune in your airship. Take the girl away from Burton. Keep her at home. Steve did not reply to this, but he decided it was not a bad suggestion. How old is she? inquired Cumberford presently. Just seventeen. Too young to work in an office. Finished her education? All we are able to give her, sir. Hmm. Take my advice. Burton's unreliable. I know him. Gorilla inside, man outside. I... I married a Burton. These brief sentences were spoken between puffs of his cigarette. Sometimes there would be a very definite pause between them, while the man smoked and reflected upon his subject. Steve continued his work and answered when required to do so. Cumberford stayed at the hangar until nearly noon, watching the boy work, bearing a hand now and then when a plane rib was awkward to handle alone, always interested in everything pertaining to the aeroplane. He made Steve explain the changes he proposed to apply to the lateral balance, and offered one or two rather clever suggestions, showing his grasp of the subject. But he did not refer to Orissa again, and finally slipped away without saying goodbye. Steve thought him queerer than during their first interview, but liked him better. End of chapter 10 Recording by Ellie at storiesbyellie.com Chapter 11 of The Flying Girl. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Flying Girl by L. Frank Baum. Chapter 11 Orisa Resigns. Meantime, Orisa was having a hard time at the office endeavoring to avoid a personal conversation with Mr. Burton. When he came in at nine o'clock, he smiled upon her and asked, "'Anything to tell me, Miss Kane?' She shook her head, flushing a little, and he went to his desk without another word. He seemed abstracted and moody during the forenoon, a return of his old puzzling manner, and Arisa regretted she had not been brave enough to tell him of their decision to reject his offer when he gave her the opportunity." Nothing more passed between them until after luncheon, but when she re-entered the office, Mr. Burton, who had not gone out, suddenly roused himself and said, "'Come here, please, Miss Kane.' She obeyed, meekly seating herself in the chair beside his desk. The man looked at her a long time, not impudently, with direct gaze, but rather speculatively and with an expression that seemed to penetrate far beyond her and to consider many things beside her fair face finally he asked what conclusion have you reached in regard to your financial matters of which we spoke saturday i've talked with my brother sir and he dislikes to give up a half interest in his invention did you tell him i would furnish all the money that might be required yes sir and he refused the aeroplane is very dear to my brother mr burton he cannot bear to transfer a part ownership to another who would have the right to dictate his future pshaw exclaimed the broker impatiently the boy's a fool there's scarcely an inventor in the world who hasn't had to sacrifice an interest in his creation in order to raise money stephen won't do it declared Arisa positively, for she resented the speech. Mr. Burton fell silent, drumming on the desk with his fingers, as he always did when in deep thought. Arisa started to rise, thinking the interview closed. "'Wait a moment, please,' he said. 
How old are you, Miss Kane? Your name is Arissa, isn't it? Yes, sir, I'm seventeen. So young. Why, you ought to be in school instead of at work. She made no reply. He watched her a while, as she sat before him with bent head, and then continued, in the kindly tone he so often used when addressing her. Miss Kane, Orissa, I will give your brother all the money he needs, and he may retain the entire interest in his airship. The payment may come from you alone. She started and became alert at once, raising her head to look at him inquiringly. In other words, he added, I am not especially interested in your brother or his invention, but I am greatly interested in you. Mr. Burton, I... Listen to me, Orissa, and let me explain. I am a lonely man, for I have never married or cared to. You are the only member of the fair sex who has ever attracted me except my sister, whom I regarded with warm affection. When she married that scoundrel Cumberford, we became separated forever, and in a few years she died. Since then I have thought of nothing but business. I am now thirty-eight years of age, and in my prime I have amassed a fortune, something more than a quarter of a million, as you know, and have no one to leave it to when I pass away. I should like to leave it to you, Orissa. To me, sir? she exclaimed, amazed. Yes, your presence here in the office has transformed the place from a barren den to a cozy, home-like apartment. I like to see your sweet face near me, gravely bending over your work. Your personality has charmed me. Your lack of affectation, your sincerity and honesty have won my admiration. I cannot say to you, as a younger man would, that I love you, for I will not take an unfair advantage of one who is as yet a child, but you will become a woman soon, and I want to make you a splendid woman, and a happy one. This is my proposition. Place yourself in my hands unreservedly, and let me direct your future. I will send you to a famous finishing school in the East, and supply you with a liberal allowance. In two years you will return to me, old enough to become my wife. Oh, Mr. Burton. Meantime, I'll finance your brother's airship proposition until it either fails or finally succeeds. Orisa was greatly distressed. She felt at the moment like giving way to a flood of tears, for she realized that this absurd, astonishing proposal would deprive her of her position. He saw her agitation and felt intuitively she would not consider his offer. So he said, with grim insistence, You may answer me with one word, my child, yes or no. Oh, Mr. Burton, it is impossible. I have a home, a mother, and brother, and I, I, I could not think of such a thing. Not to save those relatives from disaster, from misery, from ruin, perhaps? The implied threat hardened her heart, which had begun to pity the man, not even to save them from death, she replied firmly. Am I so distasteful to you, then? Is my money of so little account? With cold dignity, Orisa rose from her chair. He saw the look on her face and became a little alarmed. Please forget all I have said, he added hastily. I, I am not myself today. You may get the mail ready, Miss Kane, and I will sign the letters before I go. She went to the wardrobe and took down her things. He sat silently watching her as she put them on, a slight frown upon his face. The girl hesitated a moment, then walked straight to his desk and said, Of course I cannot stay here a moment after what you have said, but I think you, you meant to be good to me in your way. Goodbye, Mr. Burton. Goodbye, Miss Kane. His voice was cold and hard. She did not look at him again, but walked out of the office and quietly left the building, so she did not see that the frown had deepened to a scowl, nor hear him mutter, Both lost, the girl and the aeroplane. 
but I'll have them yet, for the canes are too simple to oppose me successfully. At three o'clock, Orisa surprised Steve by coming into the hangar in her working dress. Why, what's the matter, Reese? he demanded. I've left Mr. Burton, she said quietly. What's up? Orisa thought it unwise to tell her brother all that had transpired. He was angry because we refused to give him a half-interest in the aircraft, she explained. So I simply quit and came home. Steve sat down and stared at her a moment. He had been thinking of Mr. Cumberford's warning ever since that strange individual had gone away, and Orisa's resignation afforded him distinct relief. "'I'm glad of it, Reese," he said earnestly. "'There's no necessity for you to work now, for we have plenty of money to see us through. Besides, I need you here to assist me.' "'Really, Steve?' "'It's a fact. I don't like to employ outside assistance at this stage of the game. It might be fatal.' But you are nearly as well posted on airplanes as I am, Orisa, and you're clever enough to be of real help to me. I don't need brute strength, you know. Why, I'm terribly strong, she said with a gay laugh, bearing her round arm and bending her elbow to show how the muscle bunched up. I can lift as much as you can, Steve, if it is necessary. It won't be necessary, replied her brother, delighted to find how easily she adopted his suggestion. Just grab the end of that bow and hold it steady while I shave a point to it. That's it. Don't you see how awkward it is for me to handle these things alone? She nodded. You're right, Steve. I'll stay home and help you finish the aircraft, said she. End of section 11